Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Fred Heyman, and I, first of all, want to uh, thank the organizers uh, for their very kind invitation uh, to this uh, very stimulating uh, conference. Uh, one of the hats I wear at Indiana University has been the faculty editor of the Journal of Global Legal Studies. Uh, we're celebrating our 20th anniversary, and I can't imagine a better celebration than to have these proceedings uh, to, to publish. And uh, so I look forward to working with all of you uh, in the months ahead. Uh, the topic of our panel uh, has already come up uh, uh, quietly and more directly in the last uh, talk. Uh, and that is um, um, uh, collisions of transnational constitutions. And the very title, of course, uh, suggests that there are many constitutions and it undercuts any bias uh, one might have uh, for the development of or the evolution towards a unitary a global constitution. Uh, in a fragmented world, autonomous global social sectors, as uh, Guthrie Teutner has written, uh, compete with the constitutions of nation states. There are, in fact, many particular constitutions for the various global uh, fragments uh, involved, including the, the national, transnational regimes, uh, regional cultures, uh, and their various interrelationships. And it is these interrelationships that uh, we're particularly uh, interested in and uh, that this panel uh, will focus on. Um, how do we think about a, um, or theorize, a global legal pluralism? Um, and what might it mean uh, for there to be a new uh, constitutional conflict of law? What would that look like? Um, so our panelists uh, well, will speak to that. Uh, we begin with, um, uh, Paul Berman, uh, who is Dean of the uh, George Washington uh, School of Law in Washington, D.C. Uh, his scholarly work has dealt with how globalization affects the intersections of legal systems. He's written extensively on this and other topics, um, and his most recent book is uh, Global Legal Pluralism, and the title of his paper today is Procedural Principles for Managing Global Legal Pluralism. Um, after a short break, uh, Christian uh, Jorgis uh, will uh, present his paper. Uh, he has been a uh, research professor since 2007 at the Law Department of the University of uh, Bremen. Uh, in his research and extensive writing, has dealt with European law, transnational law, international law. Uh, his latest book is called uh, Karl Polanyi, uh, globalization and the Potential of Law in Transnational Markets, uh, which he edited with uh, Joseph Falk. Uh, the title of his talk uh, will be Conflicts Law Constitutionalism, Societal Constitutionalism, and the Power of Technicity. Uh, we begin with uh, Dean Berman. Here I am again. I told you to get sick of me today. Uh, I want to thank you for inviting me, uh, Gunter and Anna, and uh, this is one of the rare opportunities this year where I have, uh, I get to be a, uh, an academic rather than a dean, so I'm not welcoming you and asking you for money, which is a rare thing for me. Uh, so I'm pleased to be able to do that. Uh, I also want to apologize in advance to the uh, speakers tomorrow. Um, I uh, have to get back to DC to hand diplomas to 700 students who are expecting me to do that so that they can graduate. And so I have to leave uh, at like 6 tomorrow morning. And so I'm going to miss the panels tomorrow. All right, so uh, I'm not a constitutional theorist. Um, and I'm not sure that I have much to say about Luhmann or systems theory, or perhaps about societal constitutionalism generally, uh, depending on what it means. If it's meant to be, uh, uh, I guess, universal rights of various sorts in another guise, then I don't have much to say about it. 
Um, but I do think uh, perhaps I have something to contribute to the discussion of societal constitutionalism uh, in the sense that we've talked about societal constitutionalism in terms of kind of core political values. We've talked about it in terms of rights. Uh, we've talked about it in terms of kind of social resistance. Um, but uh, cons something that's constitutive, constitutional, uh, we also need to think about the principles that are necessary uh, to uh, mediate relationships among multiple communities, multiple systems, multiple normative entities. Um, and we haven't talked that much about that. What is the interaction? among multiple normative systems if we're going to think transnationally, if we're going to think about the relationship between state-based actors and non-state actors, and so forth. And so perhaps I have something to say uh, about those kinds of interactions, which are perhaps fundamentally constitutional in the sense that they're constitutive, and in the sense that most constitutions that are state-based do in fact talk about relationships among multiple entities. Um, and, uh, and to the extent that it is constitutive to think about how you as a community or a system relate to other communities and other systems. Um, what is the self? What is the other? How is the relationship done? How are borders defined or redefined, whether territorially or not? Um, those are issues I think we do need to address if we're going to understand uh, societal constitutionalism in any form. Um, so I start from legal pluralism. Um, which uh, was historically a descriptive enterprise um, and focused a lot on church-state relationships um, and relationships between uh, indigenous law uh, and colonial law, so colonial systems would come in and would purport to wipe out the indigenous law and create a new legal system, but legal pluralists noticed that the um, that the colonial system never fully wiped out the indigenous system and they started intermeshing with each other and actors would use one system strategically against the other uh, and there would be all kinds of interesting relationships between them. Same thing with church and state. Um, I thought though that uh, a couple of things about legal pluralism as I started to understand it and think about it um, is first of all I thought that legal pluralism was a useful rubric for studying the international arena, particularly in the post-1989 uh, world that was a little bit less uh, state-centric, at least arguably, uh, and had uh, a lot of uh, multivalent forces going on in it, um, international, national, uh, sub-state, transnational, uh, non-state, we've heard about accounting standards and private intellectual property arrangements and so forth. And legal pluralism is a good rubric, I think, for analyzing um, all of those interactions among those various different entities. Um, and it's useful uh, in part because it gets us out of the law, non-law debate, um, which those of you particularly who are interested in international law uh, may have been involved in endless and fruitless debates about whether an international law is law or isn't law, uh, when, if there's coercive force behind it, if there isn't coercive force behind it, if there's sovereignty behind it, if there isn't, and so forth. And one of the nice things about legal pluralism is we don't actually have to debate that. Um, we can actually look at what people come to believe over time, how legal consciousness changes, um, and really what has efficacy on the ground. Uh, and look at that rather than abstract questions of legitimacy uh, or sovereignty. Um, and also, uh, legal pluralism gets us out of um, rigid ideas of uh, territoriality uh, with relationship to sovereignty. Um, and uh, the recognition that multiple communities claim the mantle of law they assert jurisdiction whether they are allowed to or not. 
Um, I wrote uh, a paper very early on in, uh, as a scholar back in 1999 about uh, the internet, actually, and <laughs> jurisdictional principles. And when I first wrote my draft, I was trying to reimagine jurisdictional principles. And I would say things like, uh, well, in this kind of a circumstance, a community is allowed to assert jurisdiction, and in this uh, it's not uh, permissible. And I had a, a colleague who was a committed legal pluralist, a woman named Carol Weisbrod, and she said to me, you keep talking about allowing these communities to assert jurisdiction. Communities simply assert jurisdiction. They don't ask you for permission. And I think that that's really true, that what happens is whatever system you create, whatever jurisdictional structure you create, whatever um, uh, uh, broad uh, political theory paradigm that you try to impose that says this is allowed and this isn't allowed is immediately going to be subverted by what actually happens on the ground. And so legal pluralism is useful because it notices that. Uh, Perhaps it even celebrates it, but I'll get to sort of the normative dimension in a minute, but at least it notices that and it gets us out of the sort of classic law ideas of what's permitted and not permitted from some vantage point that's somehow deemed to be outside the system where you can actually look down and say this is good and this is not good. Um, so uh, that's why legal pluralism is useful descriptively. Um, the question is, is there a normative dimension to legal pluralism? Does it actually, uh, is there a normative project here? Um, are, are there ways in which uh, we could use the principles of legal pluralism to think about uh, how to structure relations in a more positive way versus a less positive way among multiple communities? Um, and that gets to how we encounter a stranger how we encounter an other. Um, we meaning any community you can think about, any group of people that want to do something in the world, are almost immediately going to encounter someone who is outside. Could be territorially outside, could be outside in some uh, more abstract sense. Uh, and the question is, how do you respond to that? How do you deal with the fact that there are others um, in, uh, in the world who are also asserting norms law, quasi-law, whatever you might want to call it. So uh, you could uh, say, well, uh, my rules win. Uh, that's sort of a classic kind of sovereigntist uh, uh, mechanism. Uh, my rules are going to apply to everybody because my rules are better rules uh, than uh, everybody else's. And perhaps I have the power to do that. Um, and uh, I call that sovereigntist territorialism. It often uh, takes the form of a kind of nation-state sovereignty argument. Uh, it also often, though not always, is based on a kind of uh, geographic territoriality, so that within certain boundaries, my rules win, period. And I don't have to look at anybody else's rules because we are within the meets and bounds of my particular community. Um, another way of dealing with the stranger is to say, you're not really strange at all. We're all the same. We're all fundamentally one people. We're all fundamentally alike uh, in certain ways. And therefore, let's go for a universalist solution um, where we say that we all are going to operate under the same uh, system that we will work out together. That's a universalist approach. Um, and. Uh, uh, most common would be uh, a kind of religious totalism uh, or a universal human rights scheme or other forms of uniform law. Like, so one way to deal with multiplicity, to deal with legal pluralism, is to wipe it out by uh, dividing the world up and saying only one law applies here and a different law applies here and a different law applies here. But another way to wipe out legal pluralism is to say one, there's one overarching set of norms that are going to apply to everyone. Uh, so that's universalism. Um, both of those approaches, uh, it seems to me, are sometimes efficacious, um, sometimes necessary, perhaps, um, and sometimes, uh, I think, perfectly reasonable. 
Um, but they are, are only partial solutions, and they will only ever be partial solutions, it seems to me. Um, they're never going to be wholly successful, uh, I think, because you can't, on the one hand, hermetically seal off your community um, to outside influence or to outside norms or to internal disputing uh, uh, entities that will create uh, internal norms that will challenge yours. Um, and you'll never be able to stamp out all the variations. So I think the, the sovereigntist, uh, my rules win uh, argument is not ever going to be wholly successful, though it may be partially successful, particularly if you have sufficient uh, armies and police officers to, who are willing to follow what you have to say. Um, a universalist solution will also sometimes be successful. Um, there are some universal norms that are, have gained tremendous purchase in the world. Or uh, after the fact, you might get, uh, you know, 20 years later, a kind of global consensus about something that's been built towards politically for a very long time. Um, but again, I think it's only going to be partial uh, and uh, often, as I said, after the fact. Uh, so I think as a practical matter, there's going to need always to be more than those two strategies. And I think as a normative matter, we might see both of those strategies as fundamentally juristic, meaning um, they kill off or they attempt to kill off certain alternative interpretations, um, uh, certain uh, alternative assertions of law, uh, and say, no, this is the law and not this other thing. And so, um, they stifle voice, uh, they uh, stifle alternative interpretations, they stifle creative adaptation. And so we might think that in a system we want to be more fluid, creative, and allow more opportunity for engagement and participation, um, we might think that neither of those are ideal solutions, even if they were possible. But even if you don't buy that, they're not possible to impose as a uh, uniform matter. And so we're going to need another path, it seems to me, for analyzing the other and for coming up with principles for addressing the inevitable legal pluralism that's going to result. So what is this alternative path? Well, we might look at Hannah Arendt's understanding in politics, in which she talks about bearing with strangers. Um, this is the idea of gaining a mental capacity appropriate for an active relationship with that which is different. Not trying to make the different like you, not trying to say uh, the different should be like me, um, not trying to say we're all the same, but actually having the difference and communicating across difference. Um, we might also look at the, at the political theorist Iris Young uh, and her ideal of the unoppressive city, the idea that in the ideal city, um, a group of people can live side by side, looking very different, being from very different ethnic groups, dressing differently, speaking different languages, eating different food, and so forth, um, without either assimilating them so that they're all alike, uh, or um, going to war with them, but actually figuring out ways of living side by side. So um, how can we translate that into a legal or constitutional form? Well, it seems to me we can look to create more pluralist mechanisms, or mechanisms for managing the multiple voices that exist without either stamping them out uh, for the, in favor of universals or stamping them out in favor of uh, a kind of uh, sovereigntist territorial imposition. Um, so we can create habits of mind and opportunities for voice. Um, let me give you a few examples that exist in the real world where we might see this going on. Um, one uh, that is more familiar to you uh, in Europe than to me in the United States is the idea of margins of appreciation. Um, we can all debate how well the margin appreciation doctrine has been applied in individual cases, but in the ideal, the idea of the margin of appreciation doctrine as practiced by the European Court of Human Rights is um, we're uh, going to articulate a universal, but we're then going to allow wiggle room within that universal for individual constitutional courts to apply that universal in ways that make sense given the local context. And interestingly, the margin of appreciation doctrine was sort of a half, a, a, what I call a half a loaf compromise. You know, committed nation state sovereigntists were upset that they had to give any power to the European Court of Human Rights. 
committed international uh, human rights people were upset that they had to give any sort of play to uh, the intransigent, uh, unenlightened local norms. And so they both sort of compromised and created a, what they both considered half a loaf solutions. Half a loaf is better than none, is the expression. Um, but I think you might see the margin of appreciation doctrine through this lens of legal pluralism as actually a loaf and a half solution, better than if either uh, side had actually won because it builds into the structure of the, uh, of the court itself a habit of mind that fosters interaction, dialogue, and thinking about multiplicity. Uh, and that that might actually be better than uh, uh, either a fully hierarchical system or one with no uh, court at all. Uh, similarly, we might think of subsidiarity, which is generally thought of as a scheme that's about pushing down towards the local. I'm actually not so much interested in celebrating the local for its own sake, but I am interested in any kind of procedural system that forces the decision maker to think about whether there might be some other decision maker that might be better situated. Local, non-local, um, it forces you to think about whether you're the best person or whether you might want to defer to some other set of norms or some other uh, decision maker. Uh, the Canadian Constitution has a version of this, uh, a notwithstanding clause that essentially says notwithstanding uh, what the fact that the Supreme Court has um, uh, has struck down what a provincial government has done as unconstitutional, the provincial government can come back and reenact it for a period of five years, and then it goes back to the constitutional court. So it builds into the structure a kind of iterative, ongoing, interactional process between the court and the uh, provincial government, uh, which again, you know, we can disagree about exactly when to defer and when not to defer and when uh, uh, the provincial government is right and when the uh, constitutional court is right, uh, but it builds into the interaction, I think, something that is useful. Similarly, uh, mixed tribunals of various sorts, so a hybrid court of local and international actors might be thought to be better than either a fully domestic court or a fully international court in the wake of a mass atrocity. You get more buy-in from the various ethnic groups. If you have representatives of the different groups in the tribunal, you might also, uh, again, get more of uh, dialogue over time. Um, uh, even conflict of laws principles can be used in this way. So think about recognition of judgments. Uh, when will one community recognize the judgments of another community? Uh, well, often courts will say, I won't recognize this judgment because I wouldn't have issued that judgment in the first place. Um, I think that's not the right way to look at it because the idea of recognizing someone else's judgment has an independent communicative, iterative, and systemic value um, that uh, is different from whether you would have issued that judgment in the first instance. So just to give an example, I had a case in England where uh, two people, uh, uh, one, one published an article in a newspaper uh, that the other one thought was libelous. And as you may know, um, the British libel law is much less speech protective uh, than US First Amendment law. Um, and the publisher was found um, libel. Uh, but instead of paying the judgment, the uh, publisher went to Maryland uh, in the United States. And so the plaintiff followed uh, the publisher there. Uh, and uh, sought to have the judgment recognized. And the Maryland court said, oh, well, it would be contrary to the First Amendment for us to recognize this judgment. I think that's wrong. Um, I think that, yes, it would have been contrary if it had been published in the United States and if the, the parties were part of the US community. But that's a different question from whether to recognize the judgment of another court. Now, would you recognize a Nazi court judgment? Maybe not. There's obviously lines to be drawn. Um, but, uh, but at least in principle, there's no reason why you should think of recognition of judgments through the same frame that you would uh, with regard to your own judgments. Final mechanism I'll talk about is jurisdictional overlap. You might actually treat 
the overlapping of jurisdictions not as a problem to be solved, but actually as something that is potentially useful. Um, the United States and other federal, federalist systems actually build that into their constitution. Um, so in the US, we've got 51 sovereignties, and it creates an awful mess. And it's not very efficient in many ways, um, but it does create the opportunity for multiple ports of entry for multiple communities. And when they're stymied in one place, they go somewhere else. That's good and bad, right? We might like it when it's a popular social movement that gets to go somewhere else. We might not like it when it's a corporate actor getting out of one rule by going somewhere else. But uh, that's a political judgment that we might make. It's not as if you know, saying the words legal pluralism converts the whole world into sweetness and light. Um, so there's still actors who do things you don't like. But as a structural matter, you do have a system that allows these ports of entry, therefore it at least allows the possibility of creating some of these alternative mechanisms, alternative forums that, as we've discussed uh, in, this, in the last panel, can take on a life of their own. Once you create them, once you create a forest stewardship uh, council, once you create uh, an intellectual property, uh, an alternative intellectual property regime, once you create an accounting standards board, you actually create the opportunity for those to take on the life of their own. And so it may be the more of them, the better, at least uh, uh, to some degree. Um, so uh, the advantages of this is that you're more likely to get buy-in if you allow alternative voices, first of all. This is the Wittgensteinian idea that agreements among people are reached not through abstractly agreeing on principles, because people will never fully agree on principles, but through participation in common forms of life. Uh, so, uh, uh, as Chantal Mouffe uh, has described, uh, we, want, we might want to think about how do we turn enemies into adversaries. Enemies are bombing each other. Adversaries are litigating with each other. Uh, so, you know, in the United States, people who are litigating in the Supreme Court for and against abortion uh, and, and abortion rights are wildly opposed to each other, but they're both participating in a common language, discourse, and set of uh, procedural norms. Uh, people who are bombing abortion clinics are not. So you'd want more people doing the former and fewer people doing the latter. Uh, and it may be that uh, certain kinds of procedural mechanisms are better able to do that. Um, and you also might get better outcomes with more voice. Uh, and uh, uh, there is, for instance, uh, really interesting um, uh, data to show that, uh, this was also done in the United States, that when they took juries and they actually put people of different racial and ethnic groups on the juries, um, not only did they come up with um, uh, different uh, results, but they actually, the, the mixed juries came up with more accurate factual determinations uh, about the case. And so it may be that those extra voices and that extra interaction among different decision makers leads to uh, better outcomes. I don't know for sure, but they might. Now, you won't always be able to defer to other decision makers. Uh, sometimes uh, decision makers, other communities, are asserting norms that are wildly illiberal or, uh, uh, or otherwise impossible for you to follow. But at least you'll defer, you'll try to defer. And if you don't defer, you'll have to explain why. Um, so let me give you an example of that. Uh, so um, Robert Cover, uh, a uh, US legal theorist, um, criticized a case uh, having to do with Bob Jones University. Uh, this was a case where the US Supreme Court ruled that Bob Jones University, which is a religiously based university, Bob Jones wanted a, a tax deduction uh, as a not-for-profit, um, but they wouldn't allow uh, interracial dating or marrying. Um, and they said that this was a religiously commanded idea. And the US Supreme Court ultimately ruled uh, that they couldn't get their tax exemption because it was within the IRS's, the Internal Revenue Service's, power to uh, deny it. Um, and Cover, while agreeing with that result, um, didn't like the way the US Supreme Court handled it because he felt as if it didn't take seriously the religiously based commitment of Bob Jones. 
And it didn't put enough on the table in response, which is we've got a 14th Amendment um, uh, uh, of the Constitution, which guarantees equal protection of the laws. Uh, notice that in uh, my scheme, where you would try to defer, you would take much more seriously the religious assertion, but you would also be forced to put more on the table as to why in this case you're not going to defer. It's not just because we defer to whatever the Internal Revenue Service says. It's because here we've got the 14th Amendment telling us uh, that uh, equal protection is a stronger imperative than even trying to defer to your religious norm and you get actually uh, the same res result but cover would say a better uh, reasoning process. Sometimes you might not get the same result. So there was another case having to do with a religiously based community in the United States having to do with an Indian tribe using uh, the drug peyote in a religious ritual. Uh, now there, uh, you might get a different result. The US Supreme Court said, no, 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 the tribe has to follow the uh, general drug laws. Um, but if you actually took seriously the ethnic and religiously based commitment of the Indian tribe, you might say in that case, what's on the other side is simply a federal statute. Um, and as long as they're doing it only on their reservation or only within their own community or only as part of this religious uh, uh, ritual, um, it wouldn't require that we force them to follow our law. There would be nothing, no problem uh, in allowing some space for uh, another kind of uh, legal system to, uh, to um, operate even within your legal system. Um, so, uh, so it might sometimes affect the outcomes, uh, but, it, uh, but in any event, it would be a set of principles that I think are appropriate to any constitutive arrangement that involves multiple communities. Um, so the principles would be try not to wipe out pluralism, try to maintain jurisdictional overlap, consider community affiliation and the multiple ways in which community is constituted, try to defer to alternative norms, Think of the systemic value that comes from recognizing each other's norms and judgments. And when you can't defer, explain why. And if you're creating new institutions, creating, create those new institutions with an idea towards dialectical interaction, uh, with an idea towards creating opportunities for voice and contestation and multiplicity. Uh, now again, this doesn't mean that suddenly all conflict will go away in the world. It doesn't mean that power doesn't exist and distort pretty much everything that can be created, whether it's economic power, military power, uh, or other sorts of geopolitical power. All of those problems still exist. So it's not, again, that, that you wipe out those issues. But it seems to me when you have that multiplicity, you create opportunities for alternative ports of entry. Uh, and those alternative ports of entry, over time, yes, powerful actors will use them even more than non-powerful actors, uh, but at least non-powerful actors will have some places to go where they might be heard, where they might not otherwise be heard. And certainly, if we're going to have societal constitutionalism, uh, we need to think about the relationships among these different systems, whether it's science versus law, uh, or uh, any other kind of social system, or between alternative communities, uh, whether they're state-based or not. Um, there's always going to be those interactions, and we need to come up with principles for uh, governing those interactions, and it seems to me that legal pluralism provides, precisely because it takes seriously the multiplicity that exists, provides uh, a useful framework for thinking about how we would design such systems. Thank you. Thanks very much for the, uh, the paper. I have to say, I, I've, I've followed your work quite extensively over the recent years, and the argument in this instance seems to be somewhat more procedural and, and less uh, diagnostic or interpretive than arguments that I've seen in the past. But I would raise a question about uh, uh, the conception of pluralism in its basic form as you propose it just now. It's, it may sound almost like a, a kind of Schmittian observation, but the way, in the form in which you present it, it would seem to me that pluralism raises the question um, 
of the point at which it might of necessity become anti-pluralistic. In the pluralism, as, as you propose and define it now, must defend itself against perspectives which themselves seek to reduce pluralism, either social or legal. And one might say there are certain opinions or certain actions that simply cannot be assimilated into any pluralism community. Uh, indeed, pluralism on the conception proposed just now may be seen structurally to presuppose enmity. Can't survive without enmity. And that there must always be elements that have to be excluded from any pluralistic community. Um, so my question would be: When in your scheme, in your account of pluralism, does this happen? What are the opinions? What are the actions that are of necessity ostracised from the pluralistic community, or expressed perhaps slightly more normatively? What are the basic norms that need to be accepted by all the participants in a, community, in a pluralistic community of legal discourse or jurisdiction? Uh, so. The question is, how do you, it's basically a line drawing question. Um, if you're trying to uh, defer or take into account alternative voices, are there some alternative voices that are sufficiently beyond the pale that you don't take them into account or you can't include them? Uh, and if so, what are they and what, where does the line get drawn? Um, I would say that this is an example of sort of a, a uh, a point at which, uh, if I were to answer that question, I would have to be kind of outside of any system telling everybody else where that line needs to be drawn. It's a political judgment that gets drawn of necessity by every single community or every single judge or every single set of actors when they're working through problems. And I have my own personal opinions as a political actor of certain norms that I don't think should be paid attention to and other norms that should be paid attention to, but that's a fight that has to be had in the actual context. There's not a place philosophically at which legal pluralism can say, well, this is okay and this is not okay. But there's always a danger, there's always a structural moment in the pluralistic community when it encounters the threat that its own pluralism will be subverted, then the pluralistic community has to identify that's the right. threat and stops being pluralistic. Right, and, then it, and, and that's the point at which a judgment would have to be made that this person or this entity is not willing to play, right? So one of the things that I said was, for instance, people bombing abortion clinics was my example of a group that doesn't want to play. They're not willing to engage. So there has to be some engagement. In that sense, it's kind of a classic liberal project uh, in the sense that people have to be willing to come to the table and actually engage with each other. Um, if, for example, you won't allow women uh, or uh, you won't allow a certain race to even come to the table, then it's hard to assimilate that group of people into any kind of a pluralist model. But again, um, that's a judgment that needs to be made politically by each individual decision-making group, and it's going to be contested. And anything that I say is almost certainly going to be resisted by someone else, and that's the nature of it. Uh, there's no way that you can get rid of conflict or create a set of uh, mechanisms or rules, it seems to me, that will eliminate that conflict. Um, indeed, that's sort of the, the whole lesson of pluralism is that every time you try to create those rules, they immediately get challenged, subverted, changed on the ground, and so forth, and that's simply part of the process. Um. I'm a bit puzzled by the uh, starting point uh, you said. By the what point? By, by your starting point. The yeah. starting point is legal pluralism. And you're, it seems that you are very liberal, very uh, embracing in a way, because you're saying, I don't care about this question of uh, legality or non-legality. I just you know, uh, look at these jurisdictions. They assert jurisdictions. And that's, for me, the point for a lift off. Um, I would buy into this. But um, then you come up with your list of examples. Um, and these examples only concern the relationships between um, formal jurisdictions, state jurisdictions. You are referring to subsidiarity, you are referring to mixed tribunals, you are referring to recognition of judgments, uh, you are referring to jurisdictional overlap. But uh, so what is uh, the specific contribution of your approach to society constitution? 
So um, two things. One is it's true and it's a problem that the examples tend to come from state-based or even court-based um, uh, uh, sources. Uh, part of that is because it's simply easier to find them and it's easier to document them and it's easier to sort of see how they operate. Um, mechanisms that are operating more informally uh, through other sorts of uh, uh, normative enterprises that are not reported in newspapers, that are not necessarily um, uh, available uh, through uh, formal sources like judicial opinions, are simply harder to find. Um, but I think that all of the principles are the same. So for example, if I were uh, starting a, uh, a uh, some entity uh, and uh, you know a club of some sort, and uh, so I had a group of people that were part of my club, and I were trying to uh, deal with the fact that there's another club uh, a couple blocks down that wants to do something that I find uh, to be uh, contrary to what I want my club to do, and I was trying to meet with them to figure out what would be a good set of mechanisms for thinking through how to resolve those conflicts, the same mechanisms could easily apply, or at least the same principles could apply. And so in terms of, again, I, I'm still fuzzy about exactly what societal constitutionalism means, but to the extent that we're talking about um, different sorts of non-state-based uh, uh, political or decision-making processes, uh, it seems to me that those processes are always going to encounter the fact that there are people or entities that are in opposition to it or that are outside it. And the question is, all right, well, how are we going to develop mechanisms for dealing with that conflict? Um, and these principles and others that we could develop, I'm not saying that those are exclusive principles that I just came up with, but the principles uh, that are embodied in some of this plural, legal pluralism, it seems to me are useful. And they're precisely useful because they're much more open-ended. They don't require a state, they don't require official law, they don't require official sovereignty. Um, they are simply uh, mechanisms of interaction. Uh, so I do consider it a, a uh, serious shortcoming of the paper that my examples are state-based, but that's really only, I think, an artifact of, um, uh, of where you can find the processes. I could, I, in my book, I mean, my book is much longer and has more non-state examples, uh, but, you know, for instance, uh, you know, we've talked about a couple. The accounting standards group has a process that they've created that might be thought of as uh, being more participative than it, uh, participatory than it might have been. Um, the, uh, you could also look at the, um, the Internet Engineering Task Force, the IETF, which originally created standards for the internet through a whole internet-based participatory process of computer scientists and so forth uh, as being an example that's non-state-based, et cetera. But, but then we would expect you to you know, group these principles and say, um, these principles for these kinds of conflicts, um, uh, you know, I mean, a certain jurisdiction um, in a certain place could also be arrogant concerning that the space is already normatively populated, right? Uh, I mean, why should the secular state tolerate any uh, religious um, activity um, saying that, you know, the, the, the baseline of this state um, does not allow uh, such practice? So well, again, I'm not saying that they so have to tolerate it. I'm just saying they have to engage with it and say why they're not tolerating No, no, I, I, I'm only saying, um, shouldn't it be another principle than the subsidiarity principle? So uh, specific principles for specific types of conflict, so that you you know you cluster your principles according to what the targets, the, the normative targets are. It that could yes, it could be. I'm, I'm not saying you use every single one of these mechanisms in every single case. It's sort of a menu of possible mechanisms or ways of thinking about problems. It's really about trying to create habits of mind mm -hmm. in how you make decisions. It's, it's procedural mechanisms, it's institutional design, it's discursive practices that you get into the habit of doing. 
And that habit in and of itself changes minds over time. So you mentioned uh, you know, entering a space arrogantly where there already are norms at play. Um, well, we, so we could t tell a negative story or a positive story about that, right? So the positive story, at least for those who like international human rights, would be Judge Juan Garzón in Spain asserting jurisdiction over Pinochet, other people from Chile, Argentina, and so forth. And what, did, what was the effect? Well, in one sense, uh, it was an unsuccessful assertion of jurisdiction. He didn't actually get jurisdiction over Pinochet, but what he did is he started a several year long debate about the scope of uh, head of state immunity, and perhaps more importantly, he galvanized reformers within Chile to pursue under their own national laws uh, repeal of the amnesties that had existed, human rights prosecutions, and so forth. And so uh, it created an opportunity for uh, local actors to use the uh, international leverage uh, to gain power within their local polity. Um, so that would be, you know, so what is that? That's arrogant on the part of Garzon, for sure. Um, but it's also an example of how jurisdictional overlap actually frees up new spaces for people to act even within their own system. Okay, we have about uh, 10 minutes. Uh, and on, on the list is uh, uh, Gunther, uh, Larry, uh, Hans, and, and two members from our audience. Oh, Christian, did I miss you? I'm sorry. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Oh, Christian. No. Um, yeah. I'll speak later. <laughs> Uh, if, if Ulysses today were to sail to Sicily, he would not meet Penelope anymore, but the Mafia. And if he, if he were to go to Düsseldorf by plane, he would meet the same Mafia again. So we have here a problem of global legal pluralism, because these are rules, orders, not only uh, criminal gangs. And I think it poses to you theoretical, a theoretical challenge and a normative challenge well, I think you can't react as cool and elegant as you did um, to both questions. I mean, the first one, law, not law, I think, at least in the case of these criminal organizations, the mafia, becomes a problem uh, because you know, no recognition by other people, uh, but on the other side, we have strong efficacy, uh, we have rule systems, we have hierarchy, we have judges, and we have uh, implementation of terrible ones. Right? So here, here the question is, what about law, non-law? And I just my suggestion, would you agree or not agree, I would say, hey, we have two options. In any case, it is law. There's no doubt about this. But well, how it's related to the global law as such. One, one way would to say, aha, uh -huh, here we have another type of legal pluralism. It's not part of the global law, which includes every national, every private legal order because of their mutual recognition, but is a kind of independent legal order of its own, like the old Inca before, before uh, the, 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 the sailing over to America. Right? Or secondly, we could say, huh, yes, still it is law. It is even part of global law but with an inverse binary coding because it builds on the illegal side of the rest of the law. So these would be two theoretical propositions in this case. For the normative provocation, I mean, you took the easy way out uh, of saying, yeah, this is always then a matter of the individual court-like institution to make the judgment. But before that, you gave not, you, you said more because you developed a system of I would say third party neutral principles of a legal pluralism. And I think you, you couldn't just reject to say, okay, it's up to up to each court to say the mafia yes or no. Rather, you are under the challenge of developing again your pluralist devices also in terms in, in relation to those quasi-legal orders. For example, you, you, you could think we have to respect in a sense the cultural exception. We have to accept this in the sense also the omerta, right? At least how people suffer from it and how they live under these double, double uh, you know, challenges from the one legal order and then the, the, the other legal order as well. And we have to accept also that the mafia is local government. So we can't have the easy case at all. Well, I don't know what we have to accept means in that sense, right? So 
we have to acknowledge that it exists. We have to acknowledge that it's powerful. And we have to acknowledge that, at least in some spheres, it has as much power as the purported liberal state does. Um, and therefore, it can't be ignored uh, as non-law or as uh, you know, simply irrelevant. Um, I don't think it means that you can't choose to oppose it or put some of those people in prison. This isn't about repealing all criminal laws. Um, so I, I guess I don't see it as as much of a challenge to deal with uh, something like the mafia or a lynch mob, which obviously is a normative community also. But it's not. It's basically. It's a, and you asked about sort of the global collection of states. Um, it's basically a question of you can put norms out in the world. Every entity can assert jurisdiction. Remember, juris dicere is to speak the law. It's not necessarily to enforce the law. So you can enforce, you can assert jurisdiction and articulate something the way Juan Garzon articulated something. It may or may not have any actual impact in the world, and that depends on whether other communities are willing to follow what it is you say. That's actually true within a state. If court says something, they don't have their own, uh, you know, they don't go out and enforce it personally. It relies on someone else within the bureaucracy to say, I'm willing to enforce what it is that that judge said. Um, similarly, uh, mafia could create a court, um, and they could say this should be the norm, and other entities may or may not follow that. All right. Thank you. Uh, great talk. I have a very quick and, and, and simple, easy question. Um, as, as you went through this, the, the thing that went through my mind was the question, well, who's actually, you set up a managerial system, but you never really talked about who's doing the managing. Um, you, you intimated a model, the American federal model, but from my mind, the American federal model can be uh, used quite strategically as disguised hegemony with strategic delegation. And so if that's what you're doing, then what you've got is a, is a disguised vertical and not horizontal collision. Uh, I, it, it could be, um, and I, as I said, I think that all, any structure, any decisional structure that anybody ever creates is going to be subject to power dynamics, hierarchy, and vertical ordering. And those with more power, no matter what system you create, are going to be better equipped to navigate it seems to me. Um, so the question is, what provides the most opportunities for voice and entry? Um, and I'd rather have more of them than fewer of them, even assuming that some of the powerful people will use more of them uh, to try to get away from the law that they don't like uh, through whatever form they, they might uh, try. And again, I would say, whether I like it or not, if I tried to impose one, I'd be unsuccessful anyway. Thanks for the presentation. Um, I'm wrestling with the same kind of normative problems myself, as you could well imagine, in my own project. Um, to be very brief, if I look at the five um, procedural principles which you're presenting, um, I could very well say that, I could imagine that the objection would be, well, at the end of the day, any one of these principles presupposes a more fundamental form of monism. Because to the extent that they're procedural principles, they have to be accepted by both parties, which presupposes already that there is a minimal form of unity on the basis of which you will settle these issues. And so that would mean that legal pluralism normatively collapses to a form of monism. But then, if you want to hold on to legal pluralism, then how can you avoid falling back on precisely what you said as my rules win? Wouldn't my rules win be the real form of legal pluralism because you're confronted with someone who you just cannot bridge the difference? But then if it's my rule wins, what's the normative claim? Right, so again, I think there is no way to solve that problem within any decisional or governmental structure you can create. Because those who don't even want to acknowledge that they should have a seat at the table, they don't want to be at the table, they want to be out on the ramparts. There's no way to bring them in. So yes, to some degree, there's a liberal project here that requires at least the willingness to be part of a shared dialogue or discussion. Um, and I don't think there's any way to get around that. So to that degree, my rules win in the sense that you have to be willing to be part of a system. 
Um, but that being said, it seems to me that if you focus more on uh, these sorts of procedural mechanisms that allow more space and more deference, you might get more buy-in, you might get more adversaries and fewer enemies than if you simply impose a strong normative commitment that you need to believe this. Here, the only thing you need to believe is you don't really need to believe anything. You just need to be willing to take part in the dialogue. And I think that's a, it's, it's a uh, lower threshold, and therefore I think better. But you're right, you, you never get out of the fact that if you're going to have any decisional system at all, uh, people have to be willing to participate in it. We have two uh, questions from the audience, and we'll extend our time a little bit and we'll cut into the coffee break and take these as our, our, our last two questions. OK. Um, I doubt whether even within the liberal project and even among state-oriented legal systems, it is possible to apply pluralism in the individual case. Of course, you know, uh, as academics, we like the idea of pluralism. It's a feel-good concept, uh, that thousand flowers blossom and such things. But in a concrete case in which you have two conflicting norms which claim to apply, only one can apply. So it is nice the, the loaf and a half, but it's only for the outsider to consider the loaf and a half, but for the person concerned, it may be simply no loaf at all. So the marginal appreciation, to give an example, usually means that Strasbourg doesn't decide whether that will be legitimately be restricted, but the relevant authority, and in nine out of 10 cases, they will restrict it further than Strasbourg would itself perhaps judge, but they leave no. Okay, so two responses to that quickly. So one is, it's not necessarily the case that one law always has to apply because you could easily imagine, for instance, choice of law principles that develop a mixture of different, uh, you can look at the multiple legal systems and how they would uh, uh, rule and comes up with some sort of a hybrid solution. So I don't think it's always true that one law needs to apply. It is, though, true that sometimes in one individual case, a judgment is made, and that's necessarily juristic in some form because it's going to stamp out whatever the interpretation of the losing party is. Um, but even in the example that you give, yes, it may mean that Strasbourg uh, refraining means that the constitutional authority within the country gets to win. But my guess is, and you know, this is just a speculation, to the extent that these, those other constitutional courts know that Strasbourg exists, I think it's already changed the way they do their judging. Because they're judging in dialectical relationship to the European Court of Human Rights, and the European Court of Human Rights is judging in dialectical relationship to the constitutional courts. And so it's true in each individual case, there's a winner and a loser. But over time, it seems to me you get a jurisprudence that is different from the jurisprudence that would have existed if you had either had no European Court of Human Rights on the one hand, or a fully hierarchical European Court of Human Rights on the other. Uh, I've uh, been thinking about what you've been saying and thinking against the kind of counterexample. So we've got things I've sort of picked up are more the merit and the, the deference, particularly, might be uh, a way forward, and it should become a habit of mind that presumption reverse burden of proof. And the counterexample that I've been holding to through this is extradition and the move towards extradition between countries where. Governments agree with each other that they no longer care whether it's a crime in the other country and they no longer require proof, prima facie proof that a crime has been committed and they're committed and they're prepared to allow their citizens to be extradited to another country and to conduct a defense in another system without the assistance of being a citizen in their own country. And I could describe all that as deference and but well, I wouldn't see it as a positive, normative project. I would see the habit of mind that's developed of not asking any questions of another regime and being willing to hand over citizens to governments on that basis through extradition treaties, treaties and warrants. So, so it's quite problematic. So uh, some of the things you're advocating as a way forward 
caused me considerable difficulties. So two responses to that. So one is, yes, you could see extradition actually as an example of the kind of deference that I'm talking about. And depending on the case, you might actually like the extradition. You know, if we're talking about a war criminal that's escaped from one from the country where uh, he or she did all of the damage to somewhere else, you might like the idea that someone would extradite to an international court or to uh, uh, the International Criminal Court or something like that, um, because that would be a triumph of international human rights, and um, those at least who are big human rights advocates would think that that's a good form of extradition. Obviously, there are worse forms of extradition. Um, so it partly, you know, that's, again, that's a political judgment. That's not about the structure of the system. That's just whether you like how it works out in every individual case. Um, but I would say more substantively, there's no reason in what I'm describing that the extradition needs to be done thoughtlessly. So, in other words, in the same way that if I were recognizing the judgment of another entity, there's not, no, I said that it shouldn't be treated the same as if you were issuing the judgment in the first place. I didn't say that you don't look at all at what the procedure was in the other country, whether there was a, a good trial process, whether the, it was fair, whether the tribunal was properly constituted. You could look at all of those things. Same thing with extradition. So I do, I actually think extradition is not a bad thing as a structural matter because you don't want people to evade judgment simply by crossing territorial boundaries because territorial boundaries are pretty arbitrary. On the other hand, that doesn't mean that countries should simply extradite without thinking at all about what it is that they're extraditing for or about or what procedure is going to be faced there or what protections might be available or whether there would be counsel or any of those sorts of things. There's nothing in my, uh, in what I presented that would prevent that from going on. Within that, my response to that is that your weasel word is deference. Because deference can cover, and, and the other thing is habit of mind, because deference can raise the question, are you going to ask, are you going to look, are you going to cry, are you going to second guess and judge the other system? But deference is a disinclination to do that. And the other thing is, I don't think you should underestimate reverse burdens of proof and habits of mind, because throughout the law, again and again, switch the burden of proof, and then it becomes is there an exception? And with these extradition issues, the things that you raise are not exceptions. They would be an inquiry in every single case, and the, and the treaties might not have to be signed, and the procedure would not exist. Okay. The actual procedure presumes that only exceptions can be found, and what, what we're talking about is a process in which it's perfectly normal not to inquire. So you can't, you can't find anything between inquiring in every case and not inquiring. It's very difficult to switch once you set. Right, so I'm saying inquire in every case, but there's a difference between inquiring with deference and inquiring not with deference. So inquiring with no deference is to say, would I find this person guilty in my court under my law? If not, I won't extradite, period. Right? That would be no deference. Deference would be, in general, I'm going to extradite, but I'm going to look, inquire sufficient to find out whether this is a case where the procedures that would be faced or the substantive law that would be applied or the uh, amount of counsel or protections or whatever that might be done are so beyond the pale, not just slightly different from my own, as in the libel case, then why but are you so beyond the pale that I'm not going to follow it. So that would be the difference. To, that's why deference makes a difference. But deference doesn't mean anything goes. And so I don't consider that a weasel word. I consider that fundamental to what it is to inquire and not be mindless. But nevertheless, inquire with an eye towards uh, not necessarily going against the foreign judgment just because it's slightly different from your own. Thank you very much. Thank you.